This episode is brought to you by Bulletproof Script Coverage, where screenwriters go to get their scripts read by top Hollywood professionals. Learn more at CoverMyScreenplay.com. I'd like to welcome to the show Richard Walter. How are you doing, Richard? I'm doing well, and thank you. I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much for being on the show. I mean, we've been trying to get this going for about a year now. <laughs> my fault. <laughs> Not- Guilty. Guilty. <laughs> but I've always wanted to have you on the show um, uh, because I, a lot of my former guests have been your students, like Jim Ools um, mm-hmm. was your student. I think Paul Castro as mm-hmm. well. And a bunch of, a bu- I mean, it's amazing. I mean, the list goes on and on of your ex-students. Yes, Paul was my uh, teaching assistant. Uh, um, and and I also brought him in to teach from time to time after he had graduated. Yeah, exactly. I am, I am I am blessed in uh, uh crossing paths with with artists like that. Uh, uh I consider myself very very fortunate. Yeah, exactly. So I've always heard about you through my other guests and then when I did research on you I'm like oh, I got to get Richard on the show and we just one thing led to another my schedule your schedule technology but we're here now and we're we going We're going to get into it. just one more it. thing about the students. My, you know my dad Rest his soul was a musician and quite a successful musician, a bass player, uh, primarily in the classical repertoire, but also jazz and pop. And he was primarily a uh, uh, performing player, Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, he also was the bass department at Juilliard, uh, the outstanding, the world-class music conservatory. And he used to say uh, uh, that if if he was working with um, musicians of limited talent, um, that'd be okay. You still reach and, you know, you're still working with people who are trying to be creative, who are reaching and stretching and taking risks, you know, uh, uh, with their lives. And that would be an expansive, even though if they're not going to, uh, you know, become, uh, uh, successful professional musicians, uh, being part of supporting creativity in that way is an affirming expansive experience for the, for the instruction, but more better, he used to say, <laughs> uh, if you're going to teach artists, you 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 might as well teach the best artists in the world. And that's what we have at Juilliard, he would, he would tell me. And that's what we had at UCLA when I was yeah. there. And I'm sure still, we still do. Uh, and it is a blessing to, uh, to work with writers of, of such skill as the two names you just mentioned who've been guests on your own show, Paul Castro and, and Jim Mules. Paul, by the way, made a, a, a film that was produced by another student who was, who was in the class, <laughs> Richard B. Lewis. Um, he, uh, uh, you know what, but we, we, butt heads with these students uh they compete with us they challenge us and they keep us fresh they keep us from getting into the kinds of ruts and grooves that you can get into in a freelance uh, community like the screenwriting community in hollywood so mm. i am the lucky guy in that in that equation yeah and and you i mean you used to chair and obviously teach at ucla's um famed screenwriting program um when i when i i've heard i was hearing about it i, I think even from I mean, Coppola went to UCLA. So, mm-hmm. I mean, even back then, I mean, you see, there's a, obviously there's USC and UCLA and NYU, but UCLA screenwriting, it was unparalleled. Yes. Yes, I am myself a Trojan too. I went to, to film school uh, at USC in the 60s. Uh, uh, George Lucas was my, my uh, classmate. Uh, we call that the Lucas era, but I'm told George calls it the Walter era. Just joking, just joking. <laughs> uh, I like to say we were the first class to move on uh, from the academic community to, 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 to own Hollywood, except for George, who owns Marin County. Pretty much. I, and I've been there. I've been to Marin County. He, he doesn't you know, own it. it. It's funny. His, the, the ranch is on Lucas Valley Road, but that was Lucas Valley Road 100 years earlier. <laughs> I mean, you can't make this stuff up. The, yeah, when they were, uh, looking for, when they were looking for property, from what I saw, they were like, like which ones you should, should we pick? And George's like, well, I think we should pick the one on Lucas Valley Road. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But um, in any event, yes, there are, I think, three major film schools, and it's UCLA, USC, and NYU. Um, <clears throat> people at AFI will argue with me. I, I think AFI is a great institution. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Some people say Columbia, ah, you know. Sure. Um, but yes, uh, in screenwriting, UCLA was number one. Uh, not according just to me, it's self-serving of me to mm-hmm. say that. Sure. But, uh, you know, the New York Times, the LA Times, the Times of London, and those are just the Timeses. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, the Wall Street Journal—they they identified the uh, UCLA pro- writing program as uh, as outstanding, and um, I like to tell the writers there uh, that we, the faculty, whenever we would meet them in the fall, 
the new class and have orientation, I would always tell them that, you know, that the faculty would be sitting on one side of the, this table and then the room was filled with the new students. And I would say, we sitting here, we faculty at this on this side of the table, we are the second most important people in the room. Mm. The, uh, the most important people in the room are the writers. We can't be better than our writers. We, we intend on, uh, we, we, we rely on them um, not just predominantly or largely or to some extent, <laughs> but mm-hmm. completely and totally 100% to uh, make and sustain uh, our reputation. So the the first challenge in a screenwriting program is getting the writers. You you um, uh, you know we can we can supply supply all sorts of things, but you got to bring your own talent. And that's one thing that I always I always tell people is like talent is is great. But it's not enough. It's never enough um, because there's a lot. Of, I've known a lot. I'm sure you've met a lot of talented uh, mm-hmm. writers out there. I've known a lot of talented people. But talent without hustle, talent without work ethic, um, it's yes, it's it's, it's useless. Just, just like I said about the students, be uh, the faculty being the second most important people in the room. Talent is the second most important uh, uh, co- quality that you have to have if you're gonna if you're gonna succeed as a writer. The first thing you gotta have is discipline. And uh, what is discipline? I'm not sure what discipline is, but here's the measure of discipline. I'm, uh, you know, it, my $13 Casio. I, this guy, they, they jumped in. They, they stole this guy's half million dollar watch in, uh, from a restaurant in the middle of the hills. I don't think anybody's come, coming after my, my $13 not so much. Amazon. Um, uh, delivered by Amazon for 13 bucks. Yeah. But the point is, it's how much time will you give to this? Right. Uh, how much time will you give to this script? How much time will you give to this uh, career? People don't quit, uh, you know. Uh, people don't fail in Hollywood. They they, they sort of just just um, uh, drift away. Uh, yeah. it, it's a question of staying in the game. I recommend everybody that you be as lucky as you can. Uh, and that seems you're laughing, and it is a but kind of a joke. But it's only a kind of a joke because the truth is, you can affect your luck. And how how can you do that by staying at the table? You know, if you if you're around the table at poker, everybody gets the same cards over the night. Come on. It's how you play those cards, how attentive you are, how disciplined you are uh, to your strategies and, and, and wielding them and, and stuff like that. So it's really about putting in the time. And I will tell you, I see more writers defeat themselves uh, by hurrying. You know, John Wooden, very, probably the most famous name associated with UCLA, uh, used to say, um, uh, be quick, but don't hurry. <laughs> You know, that's, that's a great quote. Oh, my, be quick, but don't hurry. It's ab- it's absolutely true. And, I mean, I've been, you know, I got to L.A. around 12 years ago, uh, and I'd already had, you know, some experience. And Where did you come from? Miami. Uh-huh. Miami. So it was a smaller market, but I'd already made my bones. I'd been directing and, and, and doing post-production and everything. So when I showed up, I showed up with a wealth of experience already. But the first year here, I learned more than the past five there because of the caliber of people I was working with here. And uh, I've been here now over 12 years. And it is it is something that you do, like being here, you just get opportunities that you just wouldn't get elsewhere. Now that, and before, and we can, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds on this, but before you had to be here all the time. Mm-hmm. Like there was no other options really. If you were in New York, you could be in New York maybe, but not really. LA was the place to be. Um, uh, yeah, go on. But, but now LA, is, you don't have to be here. You could maybe go no. to Atlanta. You maybe could go to other areas of the, of the U S and also of the world. Um, but, L.A. is always going to be L.A. in one way, shape, or form. But you don't have to do it as much as you used to. Yeah, no, Los Angeles is the world's most creative community in all platforms, in all formats, in all media. I came to California. I'm a New Yorker. I'm a Queens boy. I went to school in upstate New York. uh, And I was going to continue. uh, I'd gotten my master's um, the uh, the summer of 66, and I had uh, about six weeks to kill before going back to get my PhD back east, and um, I'd, I'd never been west of Cleveland, so along with a buddy <laughs> of mine, I got into my VW Beetle, nice. and in three days, we got to the coast, uh, and I was planning to be here about three weeks, but I, I um, fell into film school at USC, and I never, uh, I never really looked back. Three years later, that was August of 69, three years later, my wife and I, in August, I'm sorry, that was August of 66, Three years later, August of 69, my wife and I went in on holiday. We, we just motored. We wanted to go up to the Redwood National Park. Mm-hmm. 
we were still relatively new to California and really dazzled by this dazzling state. Um, and we went, we, indeed, we went as far as the Umpqua Dunes at the uh, uh, Oregon California border. Mm -hmm. Um, the first night we got to San Francisco and stayed overnight with a friend. And from my friend's house, I called, this was a Saturday night. Uh, I called Walter Murch, who was a, a classmate mm -hmm. of, of mine at uh, USC and a hugely, hugely famous Oscar winning editor. sound man. And, and the he's editor, an amateur. he's a, he's a famous editor with a very famous book on editing. Mm -hmm. uh, think of an eye. Um, he's also, this is a little less known to the film people, but he's also an amateur astrophysicist. An amateur in that uh, context is not a pejorative. It, it means he's, he's not formally trained, but he's known all around the world um, for theories that he has regarding orbits of, of uh, you know, planets around suns, for example. And, um, I mean, this guy is just a giant. He lived at that time on a, a, sail, uh, a uh, houseboat with his wife. Um, just off the uh, uh, the shoreline at, at uh, Sausalito in the Bay mm -hmm. Area, just the other side of the uh, Golden Gate Bridge. And the previous time that we'd been up to San Francisco, we had a lot of friends there, and we used to go up there a lot. We'd had a big party on Walter's boat. Um, so I called him up that night, and I said, anything, any action going on? He said, nothing tonight on the boat, but tomorrow a few of us are getting together for brunch um, at a place called the Trident, an eatery along the water in Sausalito. So we, we invited us and we, we joined him there. So there were nine people, my wife and I. The other seven included a, an Oscar, a woman who would, would win an Oscar for editing. Her name was Marcia Griffin, uh, along with a writer. Uh, he was not there, but Richard Chu, and she uh, won the Oscar for editing... Uh, Star Wars. Uh, right? Scorsese's... Oh, no. uh, um, uh, Alice doesn't live here, I believe it mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. She was also her husband is also there, George Lucas. Right, it was. Um, it was yeah, she also helped with Star next Wars. To him, right, sitting next to him, Caleb Deschanel, uh, <laughs> very famous cinematographer, but probably better known now for his very uh, f uh, successful daughters, who are uh, actors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, with with Caleb is a guy whose name is a little less known, less well known. But a wonderful fellow and a very successful producer, David Lester, he produced most of Ron Shelton's movies, Bull Durham and, and so on, did a lot of line work, wonderful guy. So there's Marsha Griffin, George Lucas, Caleb Deschanel, and uh, David Lester, also Walter Merchant, his wife, Aggie, also John Milius. Um, <laughs> Jesus! And, you know, this is three years that I've, <laughs> I've been in Hollywood. What's 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 and what's, what's what, Mr. Am. Spielberg? Steve wasn't there. Steve Spielberg well, wasn't it's there. Funny because six months later, <laughs> I I get a call from Jerry Lewis. I believe it or not, I, when I went to SC, Jerry Lewis came on to teach a a directing course, and I ended up being his teaching assistant. <laughs> Jesus! And he called me uh, th six months after that meeting uh, at the Trident in Sausalito. The phone rings and it's Jerry Lewis. I still can't believe that I'm answering a ringing phone and it's Jerry Lewis calling me. Right. And he said to me, he want, he's shooting a movie at Warner Brothers and um, uh, in December and January. This was actually about like the, the, uh, October or November. It was a few months after the Sausalito dinner and a few a couple of months before he shot the movie. And he was looking for a dialogue director, somebody to work with the actors, uh, run them through their lines and this mm -hmm. and that. He works with certain actors who are amateurs and he needs... And he wondered if I could uh, re refer him to somebody, if I knew anybody might be good for that. So, of course, I said to him, well, well, what about me? And, uh, uh, and I, he said to me, of course, that's, that's what I hoped you would, you would say. So suddenly there I am, um, you know, uh, uh, hardly, you know, really brand new, not yet full out, even out of film school completely. And I'm the dialogue director on a major, uh, at a major studio on a, on a, on a movie. You're talking about the things that happen to you when you're in L.A. and when you actually mix with, mix with people. I used to tell people it's actually an advantage to be from out of town. Um, and that I even know writers uh, who would um, uh, mask their addresses. I knew one writer who, had, who made it appear as if he was in, living in Tennessee he thought it was sexier and niftier to be somebody other than yet another writer from the San Fernando Valley, you know. Right. Um, and the truth is, unless you were actually working in TV on a staff situation, uh, you did not need to be. Uh, you did not. Be, 
that need to be in town. Uh, again, if you're in television, either on staff or even a freelancer in those days, you need to be available to pitch. And uh, you could. I knew a guy, uh, uh, Eric Tarloff, who lived up in uh, Berkeley and would come down. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I used to I, I lived in Queens and I used to take the what we called the BMT, the subway into uh, mm -hmm. uh, Manhattan to go to high school, Stuyvesant High School in Manhattan. Um, and nobody ever gave me a, um, a glass of tomato juice on the train, you know, like they, <laughs> they do on the plane. When you, so, so it really didn't matter where, where you are. And to no small extent today, it doesn't either, except that the big thing in television now is, yes. and I think really in the business, is staffing. Did you get staffed on a show? And staffs do meet regularly, daily, around the table and so on. So you, you do need to be in town. Yes, there are some productions like that going on in, in uh, Atlanta and other other Vancouver, places. things like Vancouver, that. Vancouver, yeah. yes. Uh, however, it's still uh, pretty much centered here. Right. And, yeah. and I always tell people that, you know, when you're starting out, if you can afford to get out here, uh, it's probably best because you got to do some time out here. Make those connections, make those relationships, establish yourself. And then then if you want to leave, but almost everybody, uh, as far as screenwriters and filmmakers, almost all of them, except for maybe some of the famous New York guys like Spike Lee and, and, and Marty. And uh, I think even Oliver um, Stone was out here as well. But some of the, they, they all, everyone spends time out here building those relationships, taking those meetings until they establish themselves. Um, but it's definitely something that uh, young writers should take a look at. Yeah. I mean, now, I expected to, to be here for, for three weeks and here it is. Uh, uh, I'm going to give it, I've decided recently I'm going to give it another 54 years. And if it still hasn't worked out for me, back to the <laughs> apple. You know the truth is um, I grew up in New York. Everybody hated New York. It was a very uh, much, much, uh, uh, criticized place um and new yorkers never defend new york you know um <laughs> you don't want to live there that's your problem uh, you know, i was london, ra i was raised in, in london, new york yeah somebody uh you know uh, uh, tells a story to a londoner um uh that maybe they're they're uh, uh, something happened to them that was was untoward and they say oh so sorry about that that's most unusual you know um uh, sorry uh, you know but if you if uh, if it were in New York and they say yeah that's not and you know what they done on my mother they threw her on the train and <laughs> you know it's like they're trying to outdo, outdo each other nobody's trying to convince you nobody's trying to recruit you to move there I stayed in LA because it's the greatest place on the planet I'm right now I'm looking at the uh, snow capped mountains across the uh, the valley mm -hmm. uh, culturally artistically creatively there's not a a um, right. uh, more more fertile ground for that anywhere on the uh, on the on the planet um it's it's a hugely diverse community sure like sure community sure i grew up in um and and the only thing i don't like about la is the relentless good weather it's not writing weather uh you know this is why the irish <laughs> write so well i believe you know we never we never every once in a while we were uh, at ucla we, we would ad admit an irish writer somebody applied um from ireland uh I never, I never worked with an Irish writer who wasn't a genius, and I'm sure it's because of the rain, you know. There it is. There it is. Now, so speaking of you know young writers, you obviously worked with a ton of young writers uh, in your program. What are some of the biggest mistakes you constantly saw young writers or or writers who are just starting out make? Young writers make the same kinds of mistakes that that uh, uh, old writers make. Uh, I want to say something about young writers, though. We are uh, the the program that I taught was a for the most part was a master fine arts, a graduate program. So most of the writers were a little older, and then we actually tilted. I had a pro age bias. I like to bring in older rather than younger writers, people who had the uh, experiences to worth writing about, other than the funniest prank they ever played on the resident advisor in the uh, <laughs> the, uh, the dormitory. Um, so. Uh, and yes, it's true. I lectured to undergraduates, but it was not uh, a typical class. It was generally people were more uh, 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 among undergraduates at a, at a college. Uh, people were generally um, more mature. The single biggest mistake writers make, including this writer who's talking to you, is we write too much, too much language, too much description, too much dialogue, too many pages. The scripts are too long. I like to, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a Retired college professor, I was uh, over 40 years doing that, and I kind of have an occupational hazard, uh, 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 if we could call it that. I can't help myself. I sometimes just stop people in the street 
and give them a pop quiz. <laughs> uh, so here's one for you and, and anybody who's, who's watching us. Don't worry, it's just multiple choice, three answers. How Fair. long should a movie be? Should it be A, too long, B, too short, C, just exactly the right length? <laughs> and the answer is B, too short. It, it, if you're on a vacation and you're ready to go home, then you were there too long. You should be reluctant to go home. Right. You know, last summer there was a racial reckoning um, and a lot of protest all across the nation. A lot of people were carrying signs that said, enough, exclamation point. And, mm -hmm. uh, did they mean enough? No, they meant too much. Uh, you know, somebody says enough already. They mean – they don't mean enough. They mean they mean too much. Right. Uh, so if, you're, if your film is ready to end, then it's, it's too late. I'll also say this, and I think this is sort of original with me, the, the uh, uh, three-act structure. It, it's, it, Aristotle never called it a structure. He just called it beginnings, middles, and, and, and end. Um, that applies not just to the beginning. Uh, you know, Aristotle says the beginning is the part before which you need nothing, and the end is the part after which you need nothing. When I tell that to audiences... And to classes, I usually take a, a pause then because I'm waiting for somebody to say, what use is that? The, you just told me that the there's nothing before the beginning, there's nothing after the end. I have a dog that knows that. And yet I see movies right. uh, that start before the beginning that go on after the, after the end. Uh, um, I am a Spike Lee fan. Um, my favorite movie by Spike is actually X. I think it's, uh, oh, it's, the, it's the, Malcolm. Um, um, yeah. the Malcolm biopic. Uh, Denzel Washington, I think, underappreciated what a terrific actor he is. A, a lesser actor would have been chewing the scenery, but that's that's not the way Malcolm was. Um, but in any event, uh, uh, one of uh, Spike's really, really good early films, I think the one that made his reputation, is Do the Right Thing. Mm -hmm. And Do the Right Thing, at the end, it ends. You know, Danny Aiello's the pizza owner, and Spike is playing Mookie, who works in the shop. It's one of the few establishments in the neighborhood that has, offers a job to anybody and, and the brothers in the street are there they're uh, resurrecting that you know they're 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 in an insurrection they're they're writing they're looting they're they're burning and spike uh, mookie is trying to figure out what to do and he finally decides to join should he protect the pizza or you know guy his boss an independent entrepreneur trying to scratch out a living there uh he doesn't seem like a really evil guy um why burn down his store? You know. On the other hand, shouldn't he be with the brothers and and uh, joining the movement and so on? And he do, and he chooses the latter. Spike says he wasn't endorsing uh, violence. He was just asking the audience to uh, you know decide for itself what's the right thing. And I'll give him that. But it's clearly the end of the movie, and it does indeed. It fades. You know, he he throws the the trash can uh, trash can through the plate glass window and, and and it fades out and now you can expect the credits to roll in no it fades back in and there's spike uh, and and uh, Danny Aiello the pizza owner the store owner uh, side by side and and they're having a discussion uh, and there's a crawl uh, from from Dr. King uh, about nonviolence and then there's a crawl from Malcolm about violence uh, and I'm waiting for a crane to lower Ted Koppel or somebody. Uh, I, I don't know if Ted Koppel's name means anything anymore, but at sure. the time he was a he was a, like a news anchor who would moderate and facilitate discussions and so on. I mean, this is going on and on after the after the point before which you you need nothing. I'm arguing that um, not only do home movies have places before which you need nothing. Mm -hmm. and places after which you need nothing, but so also do, do parts of movies, for example, scenes. Um, even parts of parts like lines of dialogue uh, I remember uh, I was talking before about Emilius I mentioned my old classmates two classmates George Lucas and John Emilius John as he became very successful um, went to direct I think it was his first movie and it was uh, the first movie that he was going to direct he had written some very successful movies but he wanted to direct and uh, so he was directing Dillinger, a movie mm -hmm. called Dillinger, starring Warren Oates. Rest his soul, Warren, uh, uh, gone now, decades. Uh, mm -hmm. Not only a very good actor, but a re really, really nice man. Uh, miss him every day. Um, so John put together the, a rough cut. It wasn't even a rough cut. It was like an assemblage of the movie. And he invited a bunch of us in, uh, former classmates, half a dozen, maybe eight people, including George. 
And I remember George, you know, to look at the film and to comment on him, on it, and give him advice. And I remember George saying, "John, you don't need to show the car pulling up, to, uh, turning off the, you know, hand turning off the ignition, getting out, walking across, not going. You can jump around, you can move around in 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 ways that that uh, uh, maybe in the earlier days you you could not. Audiences are more savvy now. Uh, they're they uh, uh, they're hip hipper to the to to." to uh, uh, these literate. Kinds of, they're more literate. Yeah, yeah more they literate. are more cinema literate. Although I hate to mm-hmm. use the word cinema. Um, let's call it movie literate. Mm-hmm. Um, and likewise, uh, that applies even to lines of dialogue. Uh, you know, any line of dialogue that starts with, with you know, um, or I've been thinking, or I think, or it seems to me, that's before the beginning. Or at the end of a, a line, you might, a character might say a line and say, and I really mean that, you know. Uh, right. Uh, now people say to me, and I'm always saying, no, 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 that's after the the end. That is after the point after which you need nothing. By the way, the test for that is very easy. You just imagine it's not there. Does it? If it still makes sense, you didn't need it. If it all goes to hell, then then you needed it. It's just so easy to know what to do. It's hard to do it because of the reason we said earlier. It takes a bunch of a, bun- uh, a bunch of time uh, 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 to do that. So. Um, uh, uh, once again, uh, so people will say to me uh, when I'm telling I'm, I'm telling you, you know, you got errs, you got vocalized pauses, um, er, uh, I mean, or I'm thinking, you know, all of those kinds of things. Uh, I'm like da 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 da. You know, the way people people talk to this plague on the language. The I'm like, you know, so I'm like and he's like and I'm like and he's like. Um, so somebody will say, and I'll tell people, no, 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 no. You know, get rid of that, and you can guess what they say to me. They say, but that's the way people really talk mm-hmm. well is it the way people really talk absolutely yes it is mm-hmm. so what's wrong with that well two things are wrong with that <laughs> the, the second thing first <laughs> um the second thing that's wrong with that is you don't need to go to the movies to hear the way people really talk you just go out in the street no one ta- no one talks like tarantino's characters nobody <laughs> i mentioned i mentioned jerry lewis you know if you say uh, hey hi how you doing you know most, oh pretty good you know i am now taking walks We've been in lockdown for a year. I can't mm-hmm. tell you, you know, for a, for a retired professor, the question is, how does he know the difference? You know, um, the uh, you know, for a writer, it's it's a terrific excuse not to go swimming. I'm a swimmer. Not to go to physical therapy. I go to physical therapy. Um, uh, you know, I have arthritic issues. Um, I'm just uh, uh, you know, kind, kind of kind of liking uh, actually actually liking uh, the the isolation and. Mm-hmm. And and so on, um, but uh, uh, I mentioned Jerry Lewis. If you asked when you when I, I take walks around the neighborhood and I see people, hey, hi, how are you? Nice to see you. And I, you know, oh yeah, oh, hi. You know, kind of masked and distanced, and everybody kind of uh, greeting each other. If you say that to Jerry Lewis, if you say, hey, how how you doing? He said, well, I have a rash on my crotch. You know, <laughs> and, and the truth is that um, uh, you do not need to go to the theater to pay that for that second of all. But first of all, the way people really speak violates the single most fundamental rule in all of uh, – it's the only rule we ever really had at UCLA. Uh, you can do anything you want as long as you don't violate this rule. And I can say the rule in three words. Ready? Here it is. Don't be boring. boring. And f- the way people really speak is boring. Uh, hey, how you doing? Oh, no. Boy, you believe the it's really clouded. Thank God it has been so dry here. Um, and we've had a, a, a number of dry, blah, blah, yak, a cha, 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 cha. Every single line of dialogue that any character speaks in a line has to, in, in a screenplay, has to move the story forward. It's just as simple as that. Again, very easy to understand. The question is, why doesn't everybody do this? Mm. And and the answer is, they just will not give it the time. Somebody said to me the other day, uh, I gave the agent, I gave it to the agent two weeks ago. Not two weeks, two weeks. Is <laughs> the the blink of an eye, you know. Um, somebody said to me the other day, this is my fourth rewrite. Well, one of the most you mentioned the Jamuls, you mentioned uh, uh, Paul Castro. Um, I certainly rejoice in, in, in being able to brag about about uh, having worked with a lot of really really famous writers. Now, of course, I'm not bragging about me. I'm, I'm bragging about uh, 
bragging about them. One of the most successful writers I've ever, ever worked with is David Kep. Oh, um, yeah. K O E P P. He's so famous now that uh, people pronounce his name correctly. It's not Cope. It's uh, Kep. Uh, and he says this, uh, he's written several, at least three pictures for Steve and maybe four. Mm -hmm. He wrote at least two of the Jurassic Parks. Uh, he wrote War of the Worlds. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I mean, he's just a gigantically successful writer. He's also a very good director. And um, uh, David says the, the secret of his success is 17, the number 17. And what does he mean by that? I mean, that's the number of drafts. That he goes through wow. before he's really, uh, really, really ready. So once again, you want to succeed as a writer, you got to understand two things essentially. One is that, a, and a lot of writers don't get this, a screenplay is only two kinds of information. It's an elaborate list of only two, only two kinds of information. And anybody want to know what they are, they are what you see and what you hear. Mm -hmm. From the point of view of the writer, it's what the actors do and what they say. Uh, from the point of view of the writer, I mean, there's a lot of sound in a movie, but from the point of view of the writer, it's almost all dialogue. Um, I can't tell you how many times I see uh, descriptions where somebody remembers something, rec uh, ha describes how they feel, uh, what their mood is, interior, internal, mental processes. And what, what does that look like? You know, Harry realizes that the gun is that what I'm sitting in a movie theater looking at a screen. The job of the writer is to replicate for that the, the reader of that script the experience that will be had by somebody sitting in a movie theater watching it unfold on the screen. Mm. So um, uh, you can tell me, the reader, that Joe realizes that the gun is in the nightstand, um, you know, at the motel. Uh, but I'm trying to imagine somebody sitting in a movie theater looking at the screen. How, do they, how are they getting that? Uh, so that's the first thing. you got to recognize it's just sight and sound. By the way, final draft, the Rolls Royce of um, uh, uh, screenwriting software uh, is creating a uh, Richard Walter template. You know, mm -hmm. you can get different templates. If you want to write for the, the script for The um, Simpsons, you can go to the template list, the menu, and, and hit Simpsons. It'll come up all like uh, uh, the Simpsons office likes it, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, the only one for me, and among other things it's going to have is in descriptions, wide margin. If, if there's a word like realizes, thinks, remembers, feels, any internal mental uh, process like that, it's going to be highlighted. Do you really want to, do you really want to say Oh, that's this? amazing. So the trick is, again, first of all, only sight and sound, what we see and what we hear. And don't say we see, because if it's in the wide margin, we see, right? Mm -hmm. um, it means we see. You don't have to say what, what you don't have to say. You don't have to repeat yourself. You don't have to repeat yourself. You don't have to repeat. <laughs> uh, well, you know, people get annoyed if I say that three times, and yet I see, I see repetition in scripts that go on much, much, much worse than that. So that's the first thing, sight, sound. And the next thing I've already said palpably, measurably, whatever ha happens has to move the story forward. And that's it. If you'll do that, it doesn't matter what the script's about, doesn't so-called genre, doesn't matter what happens. Um, as a matter of fact, you could even have nothing happen. And if it's integrated, uh, that is to say, if it moves the story forward, even nothing happening will will uh, attract an audience and work effectively in a screenplay. Now, how can that possibly be mm -hmm. that nothing happens? Well, I'll give you an example from, from a writer that I worked with years ago. Uh, he's only won two Oscars for Best Screenplay. I'm talking about Alexander Payne. Mm -hmm. My favorite picture by Alexander is about Schmidt. I think it's Jack Nicholson's best work in his entire career. And the very opening of that picture, it's Omaha, office building. We're in an insurance office. Uh, and there's Jack Nicholson playing Schmidt, and he's sitting at the desk, uh, and he's sitting stock still. He's not doing a thing. And he's all alone in there, and he's saying nothing to anybody on the phone or in person. There's nobody there. He's just sitting there. And we have a little bit of time in which apparently nothing's happening. I mean, if nothing happens for three, four, five seconds, that's a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's longer than that. But during that time, we are getting a look at the office. And we see uh, that all the graphics are off the walls. We see that all the shelves are clear. We see um, that, uh, that the desk is absolutely bare. 
we see in the corner of, of the office uh, stacked up very neatly um, cartons, packages, boxes that obviously contain all of the stuff that used to be on the shelves and used to be on the walls and so on. And clearly, just looking at this, we see that this man is retiring. Mm -hmm. There's no motion in the scene except for one thing. There's a round clock uh, with a sweep second hand, and that second hand is ticking off the seconds, and there's about 25 seconds to, to go until it hits 5 o'clock. It's just 25 seconds before 5 o'clock, and he just sits there. And then when it hits 5 o'clock, he just gets up and walks out of the room, and that's the whole scene. So it's kind of a scene in which nothing happens. But wow, how much information do you get in that scene with supposedly nothing happened? Right. You realize this is a sales, this is a, a an insurance guy. This guy is his last day. He's retiring. Maybe he's a stickler for detail. Nobody would have cared if he left three minutes early. As a matter of fact, it's his last day. He probably could have left before lunch, you know. Mm -hmm. So did he stay there because he's methodical and punctual? Or did he stay there because he... Uh, He's been waiting to retire, but now he's actually afraid. He, you know, I don't know too many people who who are whose life dream is to become an insurance salesman. Uh, so maybe this wasn't his dream, and he's always been hoping once he's done with this, he could get creative and write a novel or a poem or become a painter or something creative. Um, his excuse for not doing that was he had the job. Now suddenly he he's about to not have the job and really have to take responsibility for uh, not being creative or being creative as he may be. It's a really great character issue and um, uh, that that um, we're not sure about that, that we as the audience wonder about that is testimony not to the weakness but the strength of the writer, Alexander Payne, in that scene. So you can see how with absolutely nothing happening, um, uh, the story is driven forward. Uh, and... and uh, uh, well, let me, let me and, ask you. And, and, and you can do whatever you like. All rules are off if it's integrated, if it moves the story. Now, let me ask you, when uh, I always love asking this question is, would you recommend starting with character or with plot? Because I know a lot of, there's there's two different camps here, so I would love to hear your point of view. Well, people ask me all the time, what, what do you think is more important, character or plot? Uh, and I answer them with a question, what do you think is more, what's more important to you? That People say, Richie, what's more important to you, character or plot? And I'll say to them, what's more important to you, your heart or your lungs? Uh, <laughs> you can't talk about character and plot as if they're separate things. The, the, the richest character in all of English language, arguably world dramatic uh, literature, uh, is, is Hamlet, uh, yeah. arguably. I mean, you know, certainly he's way up there. There are uh, vol libraries full of volumes analyzing just just his character, not you know, uh, in, in detail, just that one aspect of the play, his character. Is he mad or does he feign madness and this and that and the other thing? Do you remember? Have you read the play? Do you remember the description, the playwright's description of, of Hamlet? It's three words, Prince of Denmark. Denmark. There's nothing about <laughs> melancholy. So who is this guy? And the answer is he is what he does and what he says, just like you just like me, like everybody who's who's who's, right. who's listening, it is there's there's a wonderful book, very underappreciated, very little known by a writer named Millard uh, Kaufman, um, called Plots and Characters. And by the way, it's plots first. Aristotle also puts plot story in front of character. Mm. I like I I think it's a mistake to to uh, uh, put them in sequence at all. I think they all operate uh, together. Um, and and uh, you know when, when for example when when, uh, when uh, I was going to say about Millard's book, um, this is one of the wisest things I've ever heard. It really tells you all about dramatic writing, but also about life. And here it is again, not original with me. Uh, it is action that defines character, and not the other way around. I'm going to say it again: action defines character not the other way around. What does this mean in practical terms for a writer? It means you should not figure out in advance who your characters are and, and, and what kinds of people they are. You know, I attend lots of, over my career, I've been to gazillions of writing festivals, and every once in a while they have um, biography workshops, character biography workshops, where you can just, outside of the context of the story, you can invent characters. 
and uh, list them and so on that presumably you will use someday in a in a screenplay. Now I try to be polite and courteous, uh, just generally in my life. And when I hear about stuff at, at conferences like that, I'll say to people, "Oh, that is, uh, sa- uh, sa- uh, sounds in." In, interesting, but in fact, I think it's a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> uh, I don't think you can invite, you can invent characters out. It's meaningless to invite characters outside of the context of of story. Story being what they do and what they say. In other words, what I'm saying is, don't figure out your characters. Um, well, so see me... what they do. Watch what they do. They will tell you who they are, just like you know who you are, uh, based on what you've done and what you've said. <laughs> Right. So, so let's say perfect example. If someone's writing a description of me, I'm the hero of this play or this this screenplay that we're writing, right? And it goes, uh, Alex uh, wears a, a hustle hat, uh, is mid forties, um, ruggedly handsome, obviously. Um, <laughs> um, Good but, looking guy to me. I mean, yeah, right. By the so, way, I want to tell you, I'm much better looking than this camera shows, <laughs> but not nearly as good looking as you. So I appreciate that, sir. No, so basically, I've I've seen and I've done this myself in my writing is I'll see this long description of like, and he has this and he has that and has this. And you could, and I think if I, I personally feel, and I love to hear what you think, I think that's a waste. I think what, what you just said about Hamlet was so perfect because if Hamlet in the next, if he goes, Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, if in the next moment he kicks a dog out of, you know who he is in a minute without saying he is going to, he hates animals, he's a mean guy. No, no. He kicks the dog, and that that's, exactly right. Exactly right. The I've you heard me say, and I've said it throughout my career. The big I just said it moments ago. The biggest mistake we make as writers, including this writer who's talking to you, is we write too much. <clears throat> the most common place I see that is in character descriptions. Oh. I've read character descriptions of uh, what kind of a candy bar she would eat. <laughs> if she ate a candy bar, uh, though she doesn't eat a candy bar in this in this film, what kind of a tree she would be? She would weep <laughs> like the willow. Da, 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 da. Uh, there are only two bits of information that you want to establish, only two, when you um, present the character. And remember, we're trying to replicate in dark screenplays experience that will be had by the viewer in the audience, okay, of the film unfolding. Not somebody reading the script, but watching the film on the, on the screen. The only things we want to know about the character in the description is our gender and age. Yeah. That's it. And by the way, that's a good reason to use gender-specific names, not to use androgynous names. Uh, Chris, mm-hmm. Pat, um, Robin, and mm-hmm. so on. Again, unless... It's integrated. Integration, moving the story forward, will tell you what you need and what you don't need. For example, there is a famous uh, character, Pat. Uh, yeah, uh, Andronis, know, yeah. Uh, uh, Saturday Night Live. That really created by Julia Sweeney on SNL. Mm-hmm. And she does a, a, a bit called It's Pat, and they made it into a feature movie. It's Pat. Well, imagine that they said It's Patrick. Um, or it's Patricia. It would have ruined the whole thing. We needed the, the, the uh, androgynous name there because the whole point is right, androgyny. Right, right. Now, imagine, um, you know, I have a friend who is a woman but used to be a man. Uh, she is a trans. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I mean the, the whole hog. She, she has had what they call uh, gender reassignment surgery. Sure, sure. Now, if you met her, you wouldn't know that. I know that because she's an old friend of mine. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, uh, if she, you were presenting her in a movie, you should give her a a fe- She's going to present as a woman in the movie. You got to give her a woman's name, a, a name that's clearly uh, a feminine name. If if uh, it'll be clear enough on the screen, oh, that's a pretty young woman, which is what you would think of this woman if you met her mm-hmm. in the street or you saw her on the screen. Mm-hmm. But on the uh, in real life and on the screen, you can see, oh, that's a woman. But from the name. On, on the page, you can't tell that unless it's a gender specific name. So, so specifically in that in that case, uh, I, I think a mistake a, a writer would make is like this trans woman Pat, 
is that would be the description, which was an absolute mistake because absolutely uh, it would be like telling the punchline to a joke. Right, exactly. Uh, so yeah. as you're as you're reading the screenplay, as you're reading the screenplay, if you're if you're watching it on the movie, if you just use that analogy, which is so perfect, if you're looking on the movie, unless someone says something or a specific, if that's presented as a woman, that character is presented as a woman, it's a woman, and as long as it looks like it's fine. If you well, if it, there's a reveal later, I mean, the crying game obviously is that great reveal, but the whole movie's you know that's kind of part of the crying game. But well, go ahead. But there, there's there's an actual movie. It's a good example. You might have seen it. It was pretty well known. It must be 25 years ago. Uh, the Crying Game. Yeah, that's what I just said. Uh, yeah. In which uh, this one character appears to be female, mm -hmm. <clears throat> a very important, very central character in the narrative. But midway through the movie, suddenly, it, and it's a major turning point in the movie. It is revealed uh, um, that this is actually biologically a man. Uh, imagine if at the beginning when you introduce her as a woman, you, you put parenthetically, by the way, she's really a man. We'll find out later she's a man. Well, that's <laughs> like opening a, pun a joke by telling the punchline right. uh, and then telling, telling the joke. Once again, you want, to reveal the, you, you want to reveal the information in the same way the audience is going to get it. And, and that is limiting. It limits you to, to the ever-present, numbing, present tense. You can't say what happened what will happen, and you can say that in a novel, uh, and you can't say uh, what anybody's thinking or how they're feeling, um, but you, as you can in a, in a novel, you've got to stick to just sight and, and sound, and you have to reveal the information to the reader at the same time as it will be revealed to the uh, viewer sitting in the audience watching the movie on the screen. So when, and, and that's so, that's so great. And I've, I've never really thought about it the way you've presented it, which is like, it's, it's literally the screenplay is the representation of what you're going to see on the screen, which is uh, on the, on face level. Everyone knows that, but yet, like you said, not everyone does that. So when you, the, the other problem I see a lot of times, and I was, when I first sent my screenplays to get coverage years ago, I would get this note back on the nose dialogue. Oh my God! On the nose, on the nose dialogue, and just kind of like, and I think we've been talking about kind of like on the nose descriptions, which is also a, a you know rampant in in a problem. Well, the, the trick is to get the mind working. You know, not just video games and computer games are interactive. All art is interactive, <clears throat> and the idea is uh, to engage, like gears uh, in, engage. You move this, and it moves that. And the way you do that is not by putting out a lot of information, but by uh, withholding a lot of, of, of information. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, all, all uh, I, I remember uh, years and years ago, well, it was, a, it was around 1999 with the new millennium coming upon us. Um, the, uh, uh, I was asked, it must have been a slow news day because, because the, the uh, um, press came to me and they asked me, you know, I have a fancy title, and and I'm good with sound bites. So I would, on slow news days, <laughs> news days, I would get a, asked things. And I was asked, "What is the?" Uh, uh, a reporter called me up and said, uh, "The new millennium is coming. Uh, the decade is almost over. What was the best picture of the '90s?" So for a moment, I thought to myself, um, uh, "Gee, let's see. What did I like?" I'm not a buff. I don't see all, all the movies, but what had I seen in the 90s that was really, really good? And I couldn't I think, what was movie? And was this the night? And suddenly it dawned on me. I had actually one of the single greatest insights that I've ever had in my life. In the midst of struggling to figure out what movies were in the 90s, what was the best movie in the 90s, it occurred to me that in this entire universe, and they tell us that there are infinite number of parallel such universes. Mm -hmm. And it is so gigantic. In fact, since we started talking, it's already like three trillion times larger than you know than uh, 20 minutes ago. Right. There is not one thing in all of that vastness. There is not one item that is less important than what I think is the biggest movie in the 90s. It just doesn't matter what I say. I should stop working so hard. And I just blurt it out. Uh, Terminator 2. Now, why did I choose Terminator 2? For a couple of reasons. Uh, for one thing, I'm a college professor, I'm a film professor, I'm a full tenured professor. You know, they expect me to say, you know, some yeah. Bulgarian tone poem. <laughs> they don't expect me to choose a big Hollywood franchise, the second chapter. Right. Uh, so I'm trying to be a little outrageous, and so should you if you're writing a screenplay. I'm trying to be provocative, I'm trying to be interesting. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, if anybody said to me, oh, you're just trying to get attention, I would say, you found me out, you know. I mean, right. that's what every screenwriter is, 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 is trying to do. But there's another reason that I chose Terminator 2. It's a really, really good movie. It's, it's a good a, script, too. I mean, Cam Cameron, well, it can't Cameron be a is... a movie if it's not a good script. Right. It can be a, um, a good script and a bad movie. Yeah. But it can't be a good script, a bad script and a good movie. More about that maybe a little later on. But uh, if you remember, uh, Terminator appears, you know, he comes out of the sky and he just, if you've seen the movie, he just lands naked on the lawn in this, um, you know, uh, in the boonies out somewhere in a very rural area along a highway where there's a biker bar, a lot of choppers uh, uh, parked out in front. Mm hmm. And he wanders in stark naked looking around and, and they're all looking at him. Like, look, and it's crowded it's shoulder to shoulder with, with, with tough guys, the kinds of people that go to biker bars. And he's kind of gauging, you can see from his point of view, he's measuring people. And now he sees one guy who fits him, who's exactly his size. And Arnold's a big guy, so this is a big guy. And there's a guy shooting pool. And he steps up to that guy. Um, and he says to the, he says to the guy, uh, Give me your clothes and your motorcycle. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a pretty good Arnold. That was a fantastic car. I was going to say. Thank I was going to say. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, what does the guy say? Now, I'll tell you what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, are you out of your mind? You, you naked Austrian? You, you stumble in here and you think, I'm going to give you my... He doesn't say any of that. Does anybody remember what he says? I'll tell you what he says. I remember the line quite well. Again, Arnold... As Terminator says to him, give me your clothes and your motorcycle. And what mm -hmm. does he say? He says, you forgot to say please. Right. Much, much better. And by the way, Arnold reach, you know, he like gets ready to beat him with his pool cue. Arnold grabs his collar, just lifts him up in the air the way I could lift, you know, this hat. You know, mm -hmm. he weighs about that much to Arnold. And by the way, here's what does not happen after that. What does not happen after that is they fight. He grabs his clothes. He puts the clothes on. He goes out and he takes them out. No. He grabs them. He lifts them off the ground. Suddenly, the very next frame, he's on the highway dressed in that guy's outfit. And he's shooting down the highway on the bike. After, uh, after a slight fight scene. After a slight fight scene. Yeah. Barely any fight at all. Yeah. And a lot of people, will let, you know, worse writers and worse directors than Jim Cameron would, would have uh, had a big fight fight there. No, so huge. Yeah, and I'm yeah. talking about. Something like, you're out of your mind, that's on the nose. I'm not going to give you my clothes, um, but uh, 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 you forgot to say please is subtext. It really means something else, doesn't it? All jokes work that way. Here's a quick joke. Maybe you heard it. The doctor says to his patient, I got bad news and worse news. The patient says, well, give me the worse news first. Uh, and he says, well, it's cancer, it, it's metastatic, it's everywhere, it's inoperable, you don't even have six weeks to live. And the guy says, oh my God, what's the news not, not quite as bad as that? He says, well, you have Alzheimer's disease. So the guy says, oh my God. Well, at least I don't have cancer. <laughs> so now why do people... Why do people laugh at you know you're just getting it? It took me a second. Um, it took me a second to get it. But yeah, I got well, it. That's the point, is that it 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 um <laughs> there's nothing funny about cancer. I know people struggling with cancer. No, there's of nothing course. funny with but why do we laugh at that? Be because we're monsters and eat no, it's because we're human beings and when we feel stress from um text, something that we heard. Uh, and then we figure out what it is. Oh, I know now. I know what it means. There's a release of of, of that stress, and it comes out as as uh, as laughter. Um, so so once again, uh, it's it, all jokes work that way. Every single joke. Here's here's, here's another uh, Alzheimer's joke. A couple. Elder, elderly couple, they're walking down the street, they encounter this other couple. Hey, we haven't seen you guys in a million years. What are you doing over here on this side of town? Well, we just had lunch at this restaurant. We read a review. It's a new restaurant. And we read a review. It sounded good. We wanted to try it out. Um, and we did, and it's really very good. It's, oh, well, we were going to have lunch. Maybe we'll go there. Um, what's, the, what's the name of the restaurant? What, what's the restaurant? What were, a guy says, oh, it's called the, uh, uh, this happens to me all the time. Uh, we were just there, and I can't. He, he turns to his wife. He says, "He says, uh, um, 
do you, uh, uh, he says, help me with this. He, he says to the guy who's asking him about the restaurant, he says, uh, help me with this. Uh, flower, uh, red, mm -hmm. uh, thorns. The guy says, a rose. He says, oh, yes, of course, rose. That's what it is. And he turns to his wife and he says, rose, do you remember the restaurant? That <laughs> okay, once again, why do you laugh? Because you thought this and that. Yeah. So, so that's what we want to go for. We don't want to be on the nose. We want to say what's underneath. Uh, and the best thing, if, if possible, the most articulate thing that you can say is, is um, nothing at all. I'm going to give you one more joke also about health. Uh, the f two, 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 act two examples of the difference between being old and being young. Mm -hmm. And maybe uh, a large part of the group that watches this is too young to get this, but... Mm -hmm difference between being old and being young the first difference is when you're young you go to the doctor sometimes and when you're old you go to the doctors <laughs> um i mean i i am old enough now and i go to if i'm going to send an email to one of my doctors and on the on the email site you know the the health site that i belong mm -hmm. to at ucla uh if i hit the little down arrow if i say want to send a message to my doctor then it'll say which doctor and you hit the down arrow the menu falls down with all the doctors that I have. I mean, it goes down through the bottom of the computer out onto the onto the, the desk, oh, or the you know. <laughs> um, so there's the first one. Now, but here's the second one again. Difference between being young and being old. The first one I already told you. Here's the second one. When you're, I already said when you're young, you go to the doctor. When you're old, you go to the doctors. Okay. Also, when you're young, you get sick and then you get better. <laughs> See now, people are waiting and they. They're waiting for the next one. You filled it in. It all. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. see, by not saying it, you've called them, you've drawn. Interesting. So no, 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 that's interesting. In, life, it's, it, it, in, in business and in art, if you chase after people, they run away from you. Yeah. If yeah. you want them to come for you, you got to withdraw. I'll bet you've seen The Devil Wears Prada. Mm -hmm. uh, the that first. Ma that magician uh, that they call Meryl Streep. Um, she won her third Oscar best best oh, performance so. for that role. She plays a very powerful woman, really, really powerful, powerful woman. She never raises her voice. Never, never. She, she never talks louder than this. That makes people lean forward, get engaged, listen closely. If she spoke like that, 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 that might seem powerful, but it's not nearly as powerful as going the opposite direction. So that's what I'm always telling uh, writers writers to do. Uh, less description, less noise. The more you put out there, the less opportunity there is for the audience to engage. Now, what suggestions do you have for creating conflict within a scene? Well, I mean, they're, they're, it's funny. Uh, my, my old teacher, the legendary long-deceased Erwin R. Blacker, he taught George, he taught Milius, he taught a lot of people at SC. Uh, he used to say, where do you need conflict in a screenplay? He wanted everybody to answer in unison. And he also would say, um, uh, before you answer, I want to tell you that it's a one-word answer. Where do you need conflict in a screenplay? And the answer was everywhere. Everywhere. Right? everywhere. Everything should be a conflict. It doesn't have to be a, 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 a you know, World War Three and everybody battling each other, although that's okay, too. But people should not be getting along. Uh, th there should be uh, dissonance and discomfort uh, and so on. I'm hearing about now people, there's, there's um, uh, oh, there's a new institute that wants to uh, uh, make it possible, wants to support film uh, pe filmmakers who want to make films that have positive social impact mm -hmm. and uplift. But if you if you want to have social positive social impact uh, and uplift, you are doomed. You can't. You might have social impact, positive social impact, but not by trying uh, to have it. One of those violent series that I've ever seen, and it's also I think one of the greatest works of genius in all of Western civilization, is Breaking Bad. I'm a big. Fan. <laughs> yeah, I'm a huge I'm, fan of Breaking. I don't. I've never seen anything. Better than Breaking Bad. Have I ever seen anything as good as that? Yes, The Sopranos, mm -hmm. uh, The Godfather, uh, but I've I've never seen anything, including Shakespeare's plays and the Great Greeks. I think it's one of the great masterworks 
of, of um, uh, dramatic literature breaking mm-hmm. back. Now, I am somebody, and I don't want to get too political, but there has been a, um, uh, uh, I think one of the, the greatest tragedy, one of the very greatest tragedies in the last half century in America is the abandonment of support for public education. Mm-hmm. You know, when I came to UCLA, people thought, oh, it's all paid for the uh, the state. But no, that back then they paid for about one-fifth 20% back then, and now they pay for about half, it's about like 11 or 12, 12%. Worse than that, though, is public schools, K through 12. Somebody my age, I went to, to public school in the 50s, um, the, uh, uh, you know, so, somebody somebody like me, um, we had really, really good schools. And in fact, my wife and I were married uh, 53 years, it'll be 54 years in Come, come June. That's pretty typical, by the way. I have to say, from my generation, most of the people that I know, it's not all, all that unusual. I only mention it because we we are college sweethearts. We went to the state. Uh, we went to a state university. We met in college, upstate New York, what is now called Binghamton University, Harper College, which is the uh, undergraduate wing um, of uh, Binghamton University. It's part of the State University of New York campus, and it's virtually free. When we went there, it was four hundred dollars a year, and oh, um, uh, and by the way, if you got a region scholarship, and both of us did, and most everybody that we knew did, it was pretty easy to get a region. It was it was absolutely free. Wow. Now Breaking Bad. What, what can that possibly have to do with Breaking Bad? And by the way, it's nice in movie narratives to have something that doesn't seem to be connected to anything that suddenly gets connected. And I think in teaching, I try to do that as well. So I've been talking about the abandonment of public schools, and now I'm talking about Breaking Bad. Well, undergirding the whole series of, of uh, Breaking Bad is this question, why does, in the United States of America, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, does a high school chemistry teacher get $43,000 a year and have to work at a car wash, and then when he gets a fatal uh, uh, diagnosis, uh, has to become a drug dealer, a drug manufacturer and drug dealer, just to provide medical coverage for his, for, for his, his family? So I think Gilligan and his writers, Vince Gilligan, I'm talking about, the, mm-hmm. the uh, creator of, of Breaking Bad, is contributing very, very palpably, very measurably, meaningfully to a very important political issue. But he's not trying to. Right. As, as soon as you try to do something, you will fail. I was thinking the other day about this. Imagine you're standing at the edge of a big field, big grassy field, acres and acres, and you have a baseball. And you throw it from the edge of that field just as far as you possibly can. Uh, you're a younger, more fit guy. You could probably throw a little further than I. But I bet we could both throw it about a block, let's say, maybe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Block sure. and a half. So it lands. Imagine it lands. It bounces a few times. It stops bouncing and it rolls and it finally stops. Now you walk up to that. And before you pick it up, with a big fat piece of yellow chalk let's say you draw a circle around it right and now you pick up the ball and what's there there's a circle um indicating exactly where it landed right okay now you go back to where you threw it previously and throw it again and make it land exactly there exactly there you never do it you do it ten thousand times it's it's going to come close right but it's not likely ever to get right to that spot why why not? You just did that without even trying. You were able to do that, and now you can't do it at all. Well, that's the answer. You were trying. Mm-hmm. As long as you're trying, you will never, you'll never succeed at it. And too many writers try too hard. They, they have, they have not. Yeah, I was going to say they lost the ability, but I don't think it's an ability that you have that you lose. It's an ability that you have to acquire and you have to find the ability to stay open to the surprises to be a, a, a little confused about what's happening in, 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 uh, in, in your screenplay. Yeah. Not to nail everything down, but to live with that dissonance and with that, it, with that unknowing. It's so, it's so funny because, I mean, after now 450, probably like between all my podcasts, like 500 or 600 interviews I've done in, over the course of the last five, six years, I've talked to so, so many amazing people. I've noticed that you know, you hear of these mythical stories of like, let's say, you know, when Shane Black was selling or Joe Esterhaus was selling those scripts in the, in the Shane glory Black, days. UCLA, UCLA, but keep going. Yes, exactly. So all these kind of, you know, mythical Tarantino, all these kind of guys who are these mythical kind of screenwriters, when they wrote, like when, when 
uh, when Quentin wrote True Romance, he didn't know it was going to be sold to Tony Scott and then turned into the movie. And when he wrote Reservoir Dogs, he didn't know it was going to be what it was. He wasn't trying for that. He was going to shoot a small independent film for 50 or 60 grand and get it done. It just so happened. And in my own career and in my own thing, I've tried to chase that thing. Like, oh, I want to, this is going to do this for me. And you start going, it never, ever works out that way because there's, because life doesn't work that way. And you have to be open to the, to the things. Like when I started this podcast, the, the screenwriting podcast specifically, I just, just kind of threw it out there and I wasn't expecting much from it. And then slowly but surely it built up steam. And then all of a sudden people like yourself and all these other amazing guests started showing up. And I'm like, but I didn't plan on it. Like, you know, my goal is to get, when I started my very first step is to get Richard on the show. Like, no, it just kind of happened. And it kind of flows that way. And you have to be open to that. And when you're writing, I agree with you 110%. If you're writing with an outcome in in, in mind, you're more than likely going to fail. Is that mm-hmm. a fair statement? Yes. I will tell you, the, the uh, I've had really uh, three phases in my development as a writer relative to, to story. And I do think story is what it's all about. Uh, story encompasses everything else. Story is character. Story is mood setting. All of those things, come, you know, come come out of uh, this this thing that we uh, that we call story. I am a trained actor, and I'm a very experienced public speaker. Mm-hmm. Uh, not only have I lectured thousands of times on co- campus and off campus, but I also had 15 minutes of fame. It was really 15 years. I was constantly on all of these talk shows, the O'Reilly Factor. I was like the uh, the unofficial house lib for fox uh, news <laughs> but i was also I, I must have done two dozen visits with chris matthews at the uh, msnbc sure you know commenting on on various kinds and i the reason i mentioned that is i can say things very convincingly even if i don't believe them um and i'm going to say something now very much along the lines of what you just said that i do not believe what i'm about to say is a hoax it's a lie i don't believe it. i've just told you that but people watching this, I'm going to say it so convincingly, so persuasively, it makes such sense. They're going to believe that it's true and that I believe it, even though I've just told you that I don't believe it. And here it is. If you want to succeed in a competitive enterprise, and there's nothing more competitive. I mean, what's more competitive than, than screenwriting? My no, God. Jesus. You know, we're, we're, we're trafficking in our own imagination. We're selling our daydreams for money. What could be you know, better, better fun than that? You know, we get, we get paid for um for what other people get scolded for you know which is is daydreaming if you're going to succeed in something like that you you have to focus you can't be given over to distractions you got to have a laser like focus toward i mean doesn't that make great sense but remember i told you it's bullshit the fact of the matter is uh that your best bet is stumbling stupidly and and blindly along and bumping into things uh from time to time making Mm -hmm. yourself available to things that you you love and you hang on to and you grab onto and you hold on on to that thing things that surprise you things that you didn't anticipate in your life narrative remember i came out here i was going to go back that eventually i i thought maybe i'll be a lawyer or something like that um i just let circumstances unfold uh and uh, what i've discovered again is it with with that's the life narrative and your story narrative likewise it i used to think it was about um uh, there's a line of time you know about an hour and 40 minutes most movies are too long the narcissism of directors they just won't get off the stage look at me look at me um it's supposed to be invisible it's supposed to Everybody knows it's a movie. It's supposed to hide that fact from them, not announce it, not proclaim it to them. Um, don't get me started now on what I call amateur chic, the new kind of directing with everything handheld and, and 360s directors calling attention to themselves rather than uh, than, than 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 trying to to, to hide. Um, the the uh, uh, goals will limit you. They they will uh, um, you know. May, um, uh, uh, again, the the uh, story, uh, I used to think there's that 100 minutes and you have to put things in there. Then I thought my, the next phase was, no, 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 the things are there. It's about taking things away. Uh, I kind of think of, I like to talk about Michelangelo sculpting the famous 
uh, statue of David that stands yeah. in Florence. Right. He says that there was this big block of marble that his workmen brought down from his favorite quarry in Carrara, and he looked at this big hunk of stone, and he could see inside it the David. And all he did to create that David was to take away those parts that weren't David. Of course, knowing how to do that, uh, how to and and which parts to take away is the difference between rank amateur and and genius. But it is a taking away process. Art is and story creation is. And I have crossed paths with with uh, you know I have a lot of experience myself as a writer that's taught me a lot. The Wall Street Journal calls me and I've memorized this now a writer of substantial professional experience throughout the media. There's no kind of literary laundry that I haven't taken in, but. My experience as a writer is leveraged by the thousands of writers that I've worked with on campus and off campus as a screenplay analyst and as a, a, a professor teaching this subject. And I've never met one writer, not one writer, I promise you there's not one writer watching this podcast uh, who has not had the experience of hearing a character say something well, apparently on her own, you know, as if mm -hmm. she invented it by herself, doing something um, that you never, that the writer never expected. Uh, the story taking a twist or a turn that you didn't expect. Somebody else becoming the protagonist. The, a major mistake writers can make is to try to drag back to an earlier notion that they had rather than, than allow those kinds of, uh, of, of, of things to happen. Um, you know, I like to tell a story about Colin Higgins. He was a UCLA student before my time. Now DC stressed his soul. I think Australian, uh, but he he uh, his first picture was Harold and Maud. Mm -hmm. um, brilliant. And, uh, he went on to become a director and a um, uh, a writer director. He did wonderful films, um, big Hollywood films, uh, uh, Silver Streak, Foul Play. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, these are really really wonderful wonderful films. Colin told me thousands of years ago when he when he was a student at UCLA that he hoped to win first prize in the Goldwyn competition. Uh, first prize was $4,500. How they came up with that, I don't know. But that was enough money at that time to live pretty comfortably, a student on his own for a year in L.A., and he would just be able to write. That was his goal. Win the gold win, not have any day job, no distractions, just sit down and write. But he didn't win first prize. He only won second prize. And second prize was $2,500. So he knew he needed a day job. Um, and so he uh, he took the perfect actors or writers day job, not a cab driver, not a, a waiter, but um, he went to work for a swimming pool cleaning company. And the very first uh, uh, home he comes to to clean uh, is in the flats of Beverly Hills, very wealthy area where a lot of movie people live. Uh, and he's vacuuming the pool behind the house. Um, and a man comes out with a screenplay and sits down under an umbrella you know, like a beach umbrella in the shade to read this screenplay. And it's clearly the guy who owns this house. And so Colin gets to talking to him and tells him uh, that he's himself a writer and, and uh, he's written a script. And he gets this guy to agree to read uh, um, his screenplay. And sure enough, he ends up producing Harold and Maud and it launches... Uh, 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 Colin's career and Colin says to me imagine if my dream had come true if I'd met my goal which is if I'd won the golden prize right. uh, first prize as I planned I'd be clean in fucking swimming pools today you see so you got to give over uh, to to the to, to circumstance and happenstance every writer I have written in, in screen my screenwriting books is, is playing God I call screenwriting the God game just as God created a universe um, so also does the writer create the universe of her screenplay. Mm -hmm. You want it to rain, it rains. You want it to, to be sunshiny, it'll be sunshiny. You mm -hmm. want to kill somebody? Mm -hmm. And who has never wanted to kill somebody? Mm -hmm. You can do that in a, in, a, in a movie. And then if you feel remorseful about it, you, you, know, you can actually bring them back to life. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, so once again, it's, it's, a, 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 uh, um, it's a question of uh, surrendering authority. Not seizing it, but but surrendering it, uh, and and once again staying open to the uh, surprises. The very first script I ever wrote was in a class at Ir in Irwin R. Blacker's Professor Blacker's course at UCL at USC all those years ago in the in the sixties, 
um, and uh, uh, when I got finished with that draft, I realized, the first draft, I realized that I had the wrong protagonist, that it wasn't really this guy's story, it's that guy's story. And that might seem like what a waste that was, I, you know, writing that draft, but it wasn't a waste. I needed to do that to see whose story it was. And right. then when I knew that, I had to throw away some, but not all of what I had written. Uh, much of it was still uh, exploitable, usable inside the context with the with the other protagonists. But the point it is, is that it is an evolving and mysterious process. Uh, and I see writers constantly outsmarting themselves. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just, just um, um, you know, art's not smart, it's dumb. I met my, uh, uh, I mentioned earlier, my dad, uh, he had a very, very, he was a bass player, stand up, acoustic, he was very, very successful, 15 years or 20 years in his early career at NBC under Arturo Toscanini, and then 40 years at the New York City Ballet, there's nobody that he didn't play with or record with in, of any note, note is the appropriate word, in the last, uh, you know, the mid, the, 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 the half century, um, and he made a very, very good living. Now, what? think about what he was doing. What was he actually doing? He was dragging horse hair. That's what the bow is made out of. It's mm -hmm. the tail of the horse. Across sheep gut. Sheep, the entrails of sheep. That's what they make bass strings out of. He was dragging horse hair across, across sheep gut. Why are you doing that? Well, because it makes a sound. Well, I can believe it makes a sound. He says, he says yeah, but... It, it makes a sound that's so beautiful that people will actually stand in the in, in line in the snow or in the heat to pay a hundred dollars or three hundred dollars, you know, for the privilege of of going into a chamber to hear the noise that somebody makes doing. That. I mean, it sounds pretty crazy, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not any crazier than writing for the screen. Imagine somebody comes up to you, a stranger comes up to you and says, "Excuse me, excuse me, I'm a writer. Um, I had a dream last night. I have to tell you." I had this dream. I must tell you this dream. May I tell you this dream that I had? And let's say you're such a generous person uh, and so loving and so kind that you decide, all right, tell me the, tell me your dream. Imagine if that person said to you, thank you very much. I'll tell you the dream. But first, uh, there are two issues we have to address. One is you have to be prepared to sp spend 100. It's going to take me 100 minutes, an hour and 40 minutes to tell you this dream. Mm -hmm. Uh, whoa, wait a minute. Uh, you know, I wasn't doing it that kind of, and, um, what's the other requirement? The other requirement is I need $15 right now or whatever else, it, whatever the price is at a movie theater. <laughs> movie theater. Right. <laughs> um, but you would figure that crank up the lithium on this guy's drip. He's mad, you know, I'm going to stand here for an hour and, a, and, and 40 minutes and pay him for the privilege of him. And yet that's, that is just insanity. And yet it's what every writer is uh, asking, uh, uh, you know, their, the audience to do. Asking uh, scores, tens, in, in, in uh, uh, Lucas's world, hundreds of millions. I'll bet you a billion people on the planet have had some exposures to some aspect of the uh, Star Wars. More than that. More than that. More than that. Oh, yeah, yeah easily. Mean, you know, so it's, it's pretty crazy. I'll tell you a quick, quick story um, about uh, uh, that, that's been on my mind lately because I, I recently ran into the writer. Um, in the early 80s, long time ago now, uh, the big item in, in Hollywood was Beverly Hills Cop. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a very successful picture, very good picture. And um, everybody's looking for Beverly Hills Cop. Now, at my class... The main class at, at UCLA, I used to lecture to hundreds of students from time to time, one hour a week. But the main class that I taught every single quarter that I was there, we have three 10-week quarters instead of the, the more traditional two uh, semesters every academic year. So three times a year, I would have a 10-week uh, seminar with eight writers around the table. And at the first class, everybody would come, much more than eight would come. We were trying to figure out who's going to be in the class. And everybody, I might get 35 people showing up. But everybody would quickly pitch the basic notion about what the, the script they wanted to write. This was a feature-length screenplay writing uh, class. And um, the, there were no assigned readings. There were no tests. Just one paper. And it was the professional quality feature-length screenplay. So what's the script going to be? And before we got started, 
I remember telling everybody that right now what everybody's looking for is a is cop action, uh, cop buddy action melodramas like Beverly Hills Cop. That's what the agents are looking for. That's what everybody's writing all across town. That's what producers are seeking. Therefore, don't do that. <laughs> It'll be one of 600 such scripts. Right. I said, that's the smart thing to do is to do that. Don't do the smart thing. Do the stupid thing. Nobody, I mentioned, nobody is buying Westerns. There hasn't been a Western. Write a Western. It'll be the only Western that's out there. So a student in the class did. He wrote a Western. Uh, I could walk you through it. I, you know, I can't remember the names of my grandchildren. <laughs> I can't remember where I parked my car. But I could walk you through this script that this writer wrote uh, almost 40 years ago. That's how good it was. Right. And it was a funny Western. Now, I've mentioned to you that I went to film school with really famous people. Mm -hmm. uh, I also mentioned to you that I went to, to, before that, I went to school in Binghamton, New York. My roommate in Binghamton, my roommate at Harper College is Andrew Bergman. Mm -hmm. uh, Andy lives in New York. I live here, but we've maintained, we're, we're still very, very close buddies. Andy Bergman is a very well-known writer, director, producer. He really was, was the force that originated uh, Blazing Saddles. Mm -hmm. He has story by credit plus <clears throat> A shared, uh, written by, with Mel Brooks and uh, three other writers. One of them, by the way, is uh, Richard Pryor. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he was supposed Andy to be in that. In, Andy wrote and directed um, uh, uh, Honeymoon in Vegas, The Freshman. Uh, he wrote a lot of movies mm. that he didn't direct. He directed some movies that, didn't, that he, he didn't write. Anyway, his claim to fame originally was Blazing Saddles. He formed his own production company. So when I read this script, and I'm still very close with, with Andy, I, he's in New York, I'm here, but we see each other a lot. He comes out here a lot. We talk to each other. I go, I go to New York a lot. I have a lot of family there. I have a lot of business there. Mm -hmm. My representation is there. My publishers are there. <clears throat> um, I said to Andy, you, uh, you like funny westerns. You have a production company. I got a funny western. So he read this writer's script, and he loved it. So he and his, his producing partner acquired it. Now, they only spent a, a very little bit of money just to option it for like a month. Some writers don't understand that if you're going to option your material, the shorter the option, the better for you. You've given away less. There's more pressure on the producer to, to produce. I heard two people, two writers at the farmer's market at a breakfast. One was saying his option was three months. Uh, that it's on the other guy said my option's a year you know like he was pleased that his option was was a year that's like an old joke there's a contest and first prize is a week in philadelphia and second prize is two weeks in philadelphia <laughs> if you, you follow what i'm saying about the options in any event during that month this guy was shown around hollywood and at the end of the month nobody bought the script so the script 100 percent of the rights returned to the writer and he also kept the option money uh, trivial, relatively trivial as, 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 as it was. So all by itself, not such a bad deal. But it wasn't all by itself. In that month, he'd gone, he'd been shown around under the best circumstances in Hollywood. Not by himself, they wouldn't have read him. Mm -hmm. Not by his agent, he didn't have an agent. But even if you have an agent, it's not as good as being shown around by a producer, producer. with a track record for making hit movies, wants to make your movie. Mm -hmm. So he was read not by underlings but by the heads of all of the studios. Now, there's nothing wrong with being read by underlings. I actually think sometimes you're better off being read by underlings. Um, they have to finish the script and they have to write a report on it. Also, I think sometimes you're better off with somebody who's trying to make her career um, as you're trying to make your career. You may become allies in, in that way. But there's also nothing wrong with being read by all of the presidents of the studios. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so he went from being completely unknown to being very well-known. And if that's all that came out of it, not so bad. But it's still not all that came out of it. Imagine you're a uh, 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 at, at one company. It was Fox. Mm -hmm. They said we don't want to make this movie, but we love this voice, and we think uh, that this guy might be right. We have a problem script. We have not been able to get an A-list Hollywood writer to get a handle on, and we want to give this guy a shot at it if he's willing. And so they hired him to do a rewrite. And since it was his first job ever. And uh, it was uh, just rewriting somebody else's whole script. All they paid him for that was $10,000 a week. Wow. They, they said it would take eight weeks. It went 10 weeks. Do the math. Jesus. Um, 
it's still not all they got out of it. Imagine you're an unrepresented writer and a major studio wants to make a deal with you for 10K a week to do a rewrite or something. Agents and, and lit managers will line up at your door oh. pleading with you for uh, the privilege of representing. How many writers are watching this who are hoping to find an agent? Here are agents trying to find this guy as a result of, of, of this stupid script that he wrote, the script that nobody would be interested in in a Western. So he got, um, uh, you know, he was able to pick and choose his management. He chose major uh, representation, and he's had a career now for decades after. Who, after who, but who is this? Who is this? Jim Strain. Oh. The script is called, actually, um, Paradise Gulch. It is hilarious uh-huh. and, and meaningful. Um, Jim, uh, most recently, last year, he had a... Uh, um, a series on the uh, that was streaming involving uh, he wrote all I think he wrote four out of six episodes of a limited series involving Dolly Parton, um, a very very busy writer. I've also I'm no longer at UCLA now. I'm, I'm three full years gone from Westwood, but um, I did hire Jim over the years to come in and and, uh, and 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 teach. But you see how a script that didn't sell, nevertheless, open doors. Open doors and launch a career. My own first script, which I wrote in Erwin R. Blacker's class in the um, uh, mid to late 60s, I never sold that script, but I got major representation as a result of that. I got on staff. They still had staffs at Universal. I got assignments on the strength of that script um, at Warner Brothers and, and elsewhere. So you again, once again, there's an example of what I was talking about earlier, focusing too narrowly. Don't focus on the sale of the script just tell a good story and think career-wise, think long-term-wise, and just sort of get out of your own way and see what happens. Now, uh, Richard, we could keep talking for another three hours, I'm sure. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a few questions, kind of rapid-fire questions that I ask all of my guests. Um, what are three screenplays every screenwriter should read? Wow. Well, you know, again, I like to say you should uh, um, see the movies rather than read the screenplays. When you read the screenplays, you're often looking at shooting scripts that have angles and all right, kinds right. of stuff that, that are not appropriate. Uh, certainly, uh, Kane, Citizen Kane, you know, there's nothing more uh, uh, boring than a college professor, a film professor telling you that the greatest movie ever made was Citizen Kane. But I really do sincerely believe that. Mm-hmm. Um, wow, what a... What a uh, what, 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 what a terrific uh, uh, question that is. Um, I think uh, 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 one of my favorite movies uh, is Midnight Cowboy. Oh, great movie. This must, must be about 30 years already. Um, Walter, oh, I'm trying to me- – <laughs> I'm blanking on the name of the, uh, of, of the writer of it. Um, a, uh, oh, I have a book by him somewhere ne- nearby. Um, but that is a, a uh, I think that's a brilliant, brilliant script mm-hmm. and a good example of, of um, having people who are uh, uh, different from you, uh, nevertheless, that you're able to identify with. And I'm going to go to, to what I said earlier. I think you should read all 65 hours of uh, Breaking, Breaking Bad. Bad. You wouldn't do bad to read The Sopranos. Um, once again, the beauty of, of, you look at The Sopranos, oh, here I am. Uh, you know, college for a university professor, and here's here's uh, Tony Soprano, a Jersey mob boss. Uh, there are no more people on the planet m- more different from one another than 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 Tony and and, and me. Um, uh, but when I look at Tony Soprano, I see me. I see a guy who has issues with his adolescent children, who uh, has a. a, a Conflicts with his bride over mm-hmm. one, one thing or another, who uh, is upset with his mother about some, whose mother is upset with him. And so it's about, not about disconnection, but connection. You want to be able to see these people and identify with them, feel uh, what they feel, even though they are so so very uh, different from you. So I hope I'm allowed to put streamers and and cable in 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 there. Sure, question. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, by the way, I'll also say I think that uh, uh, Buck Henry's adaptation of of uh, old charlie webb's um the graduate no oh, the graduate a fantastic fantastic oh, script fantastic. what a what, what a well-written script that is um now what advice would you give a screenwriter trying to break in the business today right 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 uh, it's you know 
I have I, I tell a story about it, and I've written about it. A, a prisoner, prisoners write to me, prisoners who are writers, and one prisoner wrote to me a really beautiful. He didn't send me a script, but he asked for permission to send the script. Mm-hmm. And by the way, that's that's the way to to do it is to to write a good query letter. Um, when I see uh, writers tell me that they wrote a query letter and nobody's responding, and I read the letter, it's a lousy. It's, it's an invariably a, a lousy letter. Um, the the thing you should do is the, is the one thing that only you can do. Directors can't do it. Actors can't do it. Cutters, uh, costumers, hairdressers, lawyers, producers, agents, they can't do this. And that is to write. Uh, this particular prisoner wrote to me and he said, I, uh, uh, um, I've written four screenplays. Right away, I love this guy. He's not, he hasn't written one screenplay and he just wants to send it off to right. the professor. He's written four screenplays. Remember, um, when a screenplay doesn't sell, as we said before, all kinds of – I gave examples of all kinds of, of um, uh, uh, rewards that can accrue besides the sale of the, of, of, the, uh, of the script. Every screenwriter is an independent entrepreneur, a businessman, a businesswoman, and every business has something called inventory. And that you create your own inventory, and it may sell way down the line. Um, you know, uh, Mel, uh, Melvin Van Peebles uh, wrote, um, he won the Oscar for, for Clint's picture. It was also Best Picture of the Year, Unforgiven. Mm-hmm. That script sat around for 20 years. Mm-hmm. Um, the, uh, uh, I've, I've had uh, material bought, uh, and I've had, I had, my last novel was actually a, I also am a, an author of fiction and nonfiction. The last novel that I wrote I started as a screenplay at least 30 years ago, uh, and it came out like 20 years later as a novel. I used it ultimately as an outline, an elaborate outline for a novel, and I was able to um, sell it as a novel and get it published as a novel, and it became a Times bestseller just for one week and only at like number 13. But, you know, not I'll take it. I'll take it. It earned out its advance in its first printing, and that's unusual that, en- that something like 94, 5, or 6 percent of published books do not earn out their advance. This one did it on the, the first printing. Again, though, years, then once it was a novel, suddenly there was interest in it as a, uh, a film. Sure. Ditto on, a, on another novel that I wrote. I, I wrote it as a, an elaborate outline, uh, really an elaborate treatment. Uh, somebody once said, Dorothy Parker said, Hollywood is the one place on earth where you could die of encouragement. Uh, <laughs> It's so true. It's so true. So many true. people encouraged me on this script. What I never got was a nickel for it. Eventually, I used it as an outline for a novel, and that was extremely naive. Novels are even harder to sell than than screenplays, believe it or not. Um, but I did sell it. And the answer there, by the way, is that naivete is your friend. Be naive. Be stupid. Um the uh, that novel, then suddenly because it was a novel and it had been published, had been auth- authenticated, approved by a major New York uh, uh, publishing conglomerate. Suddenly, it was legitimate in Hollywood, and immediately the rights sold to a studio that had previously uh, turned passed, it down. Passed on the script, of uh, course. So you you just you just don't know. The only you know, I, I am even though I'm retired now, um, the regents still require. That every day, I, since I'm a former college professor, I must quote Socrates <laughs> every day, once a day. Thanks for laughing. Here's, here's my quote for today. I think it's the smartest thing anybody ever said. And here's Socrates. He said, the only thing you know for sure is that you don't know anything for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you one last quick story. Yeah. Uh, I am now in the lockdown. I can't do it. But I am a fanatical, obsessive, compulsive swimmer. At UCLA, I swam in, over my 40 years uh, in the Sunset Canyon Recreation Center pool. Literally, now people say literally when they mean figuratively, but I mean it in the traditional sense. I swam 12 or 13 or 14,000 miles in that pool every day, 1,600, uh, 1,700 meters in, in that pool. In 1984, no, in 1984, the Olympics were here in, in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And then in 1988, they were in Korea. They were in Seoul. And that year, 88, um, the women's swim team coach, uh, the American women's swim team coach, brought all the women from across the country, wherever they were, and guess where they were? Where you'd think, Florida, 
Texas, California. That's where the swimmers are, apparently. He brought the women all to uh, UCLA six weeks before the game. They would, tra- they would train in Los Angeles for two weeks, then Honolulu for two weeks, then two weeks before the games, they would, they would be in Seoul and they would be working out there. The idea being that there should be no jet lag you know, in a sport like swimming of just a few hundredths of a second makes a difference between metal and nothing. And um, so for two weeks, I was, we had set aside several lanes for the uh, Olympians, uh, and I was swimming alongside some real, real champions, including a, a woman from Cerrito, some kind of pointing to the east of here, mm-hmm. a Janet Evans, champion swimmer. And if you watch J- Janet Evans swim, you see it's very splashy. It's very inelegant. She doesn't have long, graceful strokes. It doesn't look very efficient. Mm-hmm. She only does one thing right, and can you guess what that is? She goes fast. She The water just boils around her. Um, and I overheard a – there was a lot of press coming up there because there were these athletic right. stars. And I overheard a coach, uh, the coach, giving a, an interview to a reporter. And the reporter was asking him, why don't you work with Janet Evans on her stroke? It's so sloppy. It's so <laughs> splashy. It's so inefficient. And the coach said something that I think is great advice for coaches uh, giving advice to uh, swimmers, but also parents giving advice to children – and um, arts educators like me giving advice to artists. Uh, and here's what he said to the reporter. Why don't you work against the question? Why don't you help her with her stroke, improve her stroke? And he said, you know, half being a coach, he said, half the job is showing the way. And the other half is getting out of the way. Mm. And I think too many writers get in our own way. I have a little code. If you read my book, Essentials of Screenwriting, the middle section the big section is, is called Notes on Notes, mm-hmm. and it has evolved over the years from my doing script analysis. I do a lot of uh, script doctoring uh, off campus, working with writers who want uh, notes on their script. Some of them are actually uh, you know, writers with deals at studios who are saying, hey, Richie, ask me the hard questions before the producer asks them. They can pay me a nice fee. They're getting a, you know, half a million dollars or more. And sometimes producers themselves will come to me and say, listen, she owes us another draft. Help us, help us, her, give us your, your notes um, and, uh, uh, and so on. And out of that process, uh, as I read scripts, I make notes in the margins. There has evolved a whole litany, a whole catalog um, of, of advice that I give, give to writers. And one of them is Guyao. G-O-O-Y-O-W, I'll write next to somebody's um, uh, speech, a line of dialogue that they've written. Um, and it stands for Get Out of Your Own Way, Gu Yao. I'll see in the middle of a speech a beautiful, beautiful line, but it's, it's uh, masked by overwriting. There's something that comes before it that isn't necessary. There's something that comes after it that isn't, uh, isn't necessary. The trick is, once again, to you can succeed at this if you will do, really do three things. One is only sight and sound. Only sight and sound. Stick to sight and sound. Look at your page and imagine what, what a viewer in, in, in the audience is seeing. And if you can't see that, then, then it needs attention. It's, it's something else. The next thing is, as I already said, uh, it's got, every single sight and every sound has to move the story forward. It's so easy to know if it does that or doesn't do that by just eliminating it and imagine that it's that it's not there. Mm-hmm. Uh, if it still plays, then you didn't need it. Remember, integra- all rules are off if it's integration. Forgive me because I'm going to tell you one last quick joke. A guy goes into a library. I should say before I tell you this, one of the things that I'm really against is parenthetical directions. Mm. Uh, I've seen scripts with, without one line that didn't have uh, with, with that did not have one single line without it. I've seen scripts. If you took out the parenthetical directions, you'd lose eight, even twelve pages just parenthetical <laughs> directions. So I'm against par- you know Shakespeare never had melancholy. Hamlet melancholy. Nevertheless, here's a joke. Um, a guy walks into the library and he steps up to the desk and he says, "The library and I have a hamburger, a coke, uh, and an order of fries." So the librarian says, to him, "Sir." <laughs> This is a library. He says, oh, I'll have a hamburger and a Coke and an order. Okay, you understand? Now, why do I tell you that joke? Because if that were dialogue, 
in a screenplay, you'd have to have the parenthetical whispers or whispering. Right. If you didn't, if you took that out, well, I'll have a hammer. Oh, and he says, this is library. And then you have the line again. It doesn't make any, you need the whispering. It all goes to hell without that. But that's exceptional. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you confuse the exception for the rule, you're going to fall on your, on your face uh, every time. So <laughs> less is more. You have to say less. We've been trained to write too much. We have to go against that. I once said to Sid Field, I miss him every day. He was a good pal of mine. Um, maturing is, and Sid agreed with me deeply. He's, uh, I said, maturing as a writer means not merely learning to throw stuff away, but learning to love to throw stuff away. Yeah, and it's not, it's not easy for sure. No. Now, where can people find your book and find out more about you? God bless us. Somebody was saying the other day, uh, is Amazon a wonderful or a dreadful thing? And the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, Agreed. Agreed 100%. <laughs> and you can find it on Amazon. You can also go to my, my website, Richard Walter. There's no S at the end of my, my name, richardwalter.com, mm -hmm. um, which will give you, fill you in about my, my, my webinars. I do a – I have been offering – I've offered about a half a dozen times since I've retired a six-week limited enrollment um, interactive um, – online webinar this goes back to before the pandemic mm -hmm. uh anybody anywhere in the world can and and people all around the world some people you know like in sydney australia are on it at three in the morning or whatever it is um it's uh, six weeks uh, one day a week 90 minute session that we do we review writers pages who are participating it is limited enrollment i do need to tell you that as soon as we announce it it sells out anybody who is interested in taking that should Go to my uh, website, and uh, there you'll, figure, you, you'll be able to communicate with my manager, Kathy Berardi, to be put on the list of people to be notified the next time we offer it so you get a, a chance to enroll it if, in it if you want to. My book is Essentials of Screenwriting, the, the, my current screenwriting book. Uh, I just got a um, royalty check um, from the American publisher for it. Uh, why do I tell you that? Because I also got a royalty check from the uh, the Beijing publisher of of its Mandarin translation. And listen to me carefully now. The the uh, <laughs> Chinese payment was fifty five zero, fifty times larger than the American royalty. I mean, I'm apparently I'm a big hit. You can't walk. You can't China. walk the streets. You can't walk the streets in Beijing. <laughs> <laughs> I have enjoyed, uh, uh, um, not recently, but I, I, I went, was in, in uh, China. I toured China in 87 uh, with a group of scholars. They treated us like rock stars, and I had a ball there. And I was back about 10 years ago. Um, writers came from all over the People's Republic to hear me for a week in Xi'an, the ancient central, central capital. Um, but uh, it, what's interesting to me, and I have traveled all around the world and, and, and uh, you know, done a lot of international uh, uh, events, including consulting with, with, audience, with, with, uh, uh, with National Film Development Corporation officials. And they all want to know, they all ask me the same qu question. You know, um, films made outside the United States, only one in ten is ever shown outside the country of its origin, but all. All American films are shown outside the country of their origin. Some are only shown outside the country of their origin because they can't even get a domestic uh, distribution uh, deal here. And I think uh, they want to know how they can get that for their own films. And I think it has to do with, with diversity. Even, even uh, before casting was diverse uh, and it needs to be still more diverse, there is something in the American psyche um, that is biological, I think. There's something about narrative. I really believe that Aristotle's model of the narrative, what is a story? A story is a, real, a really well-constructed story, is a model, an idealized, romanticized model of a, of a human life. Childhood, which is short, mm -hmm. big middle, and ideally a very, very quick ending. Um, <laughs> you know, Raise your hand high if you're looking forward to being on resuscitators and IVs, you know, for 30, for, for let's say four, five, six years at the end of your life. Most people, right. you know, she passed away peacefully in her sleep. So, and, and by the way, that's also a good, a good reason to realize that uh, every screenplay is a, is, is a self-portrait. Yeah. 
It's a model of a human life. Whose life? The person who's writing it, regardless mm -hmm. of whatever else uh, it's about. And that's why, you know, there's a guy, I, uh, a very popular screenwriting educator over the years, not a um, university guy, and you know, self-appointed, one of the self-appointed gurus, very popular. And one thing he says, and both, by the way, most of all of the gurus, I mentioned Sid Field, we pretty much, we, get, we, we agree about much more than we you know, then what Disagree. separates us. Mainly we agree it's, 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 about, it's really about story. But this guy and I have one disagreement. He says, whatever you do, don't write your own personal little story. Yeah, I know, I, I know, I, I know who you're talking about. <laughs> he says, you should be, if you're a professional, you should be treating yourself as, you want other people to treat you like a professional? You got to treat yourself as a professional. Professional gauges um, what's hot now? By the way, everything I'm saying now is a lie. I, I disagree with everything I'm saying now, but aren't I saying it persuasively? Very much you, so. You got to gauge. You, do you know what the grosses were last weekend, and so on? And what are the and, are, and stay apprised of the trades. And uh, in fact, there's one very popular book that says you should actually stop people in the street and ask them uh, about an idea that you have before you get started. Uh, to see, especially young people should ask young people. They're the main audience. Are you, would you be interested in? Can you imagine? Can you imagine um, somebody being interested in something that the writer herself isn't even interested in? You know? Mm -hmm. um, can you imagine somebody comes up to you and says, uh, uh, "I have an idea for for you know? Can I tell you what? It, uh, I won't. I just want to tell you the idea. It's about a uh, high school chemistry teacher who gets cancer." Uh, and he, uh, uh, so he goes into the meth trade. I mean, that's the stupidest idea you ever heard of. If somebody so told you that's going to be 63 hours of genius, you'd figure they're crazy. What about if somebody came up to you and said, I have an idea for a movie. Um, uh, this guy stutters, uh, but he has to give a speech. So he hires a speech therapist and he gives the speech. Oscar winner. Well, that's a stupid... <laughs> What if the guy said, oh, well, I'm sorry that you don't like it, but I, I think it's actually going to win the Oscar for Best Screenplay and Best Picture. You'd figure this is a, a lunatic who needs to be, uh, you know, 911, 911. And yet, of course, that is an Oscar winning, that is the Oscar winning movie, the... the uh, uh, King's Speech. King, the King's Speech. Um, so so uh, uh, all you can... I'm, I'm saying quite the contrary. I'm saying it's not okay to write your own personal... I'm saying that's the only story you should ever you should ever be able able to write. I told you that I went to school with George Lucas. Um, Francis, Francis Ford Coppola, when he formed his company, American Zoetrope, he took George under his wing. He kind of mm -hmm. mentored George. Mm -hmm. um, George's father uh, was an executive at Xerox. And um, Francis, who was not above looking for a uh, bargain, Asked George when he formed Zoetrope, can you talk to your dad maybe about getting us, you know, discounted uh, uh, <laughs> photocopy services, you know, discounted rates for, for, <laughs> for the photocopying. And George said to him, um, no, I can't do that. I don't get along with my father. We're kind of estranged. He thinks I'm wasting my life in this business. He's hoping for me to get over this and get into something where I could make a living, you know. Uh, and uh, I can't ask him for any. We, we don't get along well. Well, who is the antagonist in Star Wars? It's a guy named Vader. V a d e r. V a t e r. Vater in German means father. Darth Vader, dark father. Look, I am your father. Mm -hmm. I'm here to tell you that Star Wars is a very keenly, personal. deeply personal movie, and you don't have a chance as a writer. If you're trying to figure out what other people will respond to, you have to write about what you care about. And just like the writers, David Chase and his writers who, who, who created the, uh, um, the Sopranos, you have to do it in such a way that even though it's very different universe, very different people, it's still humans. I tell you again, I really believe that, um, bio that, that narrative is a biological enterprise. We need it. In our lives, it has been pointed out. You know, when we talked about uplift before, I was mm -hmm. I was saying beware of uplift. I mean, have you ever seen Macbeth? Is it uplifting? Mm -hmm. uh, Hamlet ends with nine corpses on the stage. Some of them have been run through on swords. Some of them have been uh, poisoned. Um, uh, gone with the wind. Uh, very very dark, unhappy ending. 
the Godfather, terrible, uh, uh, you know, h- hardly, uh, hardly uplifting. Um, you do not need to worry about uplifting. I will tell you that I once lectured, though I'm not a Christian, I'm not, not an evangelical Christian. I lectured to a uh, convention of evangelical Christians, 500 pastors from all across the country in Chicago about ten, oh, six or eight years ago gathered in Chicago for the weekend. I will tell you also that I never um, experienced a more loving, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. more affirming group. They were just wonderful. I had the best time with these preachers. Um, and I was telling them that if you want people, why was I there? Well, because they were exploring the, the uh, narrative in Scripture. You know, if you look at uh, the Old Testament uh, matter of fact, if you look at the New Testament or if you look at the Muslim Bible, the Quran, there's advice, there's commentary, mm-hmm. there are principles. Mainly it's stories. And by the way, they are not polite, reassuring, comfortable stories. You know, the very, I still remember being at a boring um, uh, event at, at, at a, a religious institution alongside my son. And we were both looking at the in front of us, on, you know, in the in the back of the uh, pews in front of us were Bibles, and so we were looking at the at Genesis and the story of Lot, um, the very first book of the Bible, Genesis, uh, and his story about this old man whose daughters get him drunk. Um, each of his daughters get gets him drunk so that they can have sex with him and, and conceive a child with him. That's not some tabloid. That's holy mm-hmm. scripture. You know? mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So in any event, um, again, I told the preachers that if they want to keep people in the church uh, after Sunday morning, after they leave the church, mm-hmm. that is to say, if you want them to be hefting and considering uh, their sermon all, all day, and if it's a really good sermon, what about the rest of the week? Thinking about what Pastor Jones said, that was kind of provocative. I went on one hand, if you want them to do that, and rather than just forget about it, you don't have to make them feel good. You just have to make them feel. Mm. Ditto screenwriters. Imagine you're walking past a screen, a, a, a movie theater. Suddenly the door is open. The movie is just broken. It's ended. And the people all stream out. And they're all sobbing. <laughs> really, right, right. You know, really, really crying. You'd say to yourself, gee, that was a Sad movie, you know. That made them feel. So I, I sure don't want to see that one. The hell I don't. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get right in line right then and there. I'm gonna stand up my date to see that movie. Right. If it made people feel that strong, imagine you're walking down the street and you run into somebody who's like wobbling and short of breath, and you think they might fall down, and you're so generous, a a, a citizen, that you say, "Hey, you okay?" And you take them and you guide them to, let's say, there's a bus stop. A bench, a, right. a few benches there. You're sitting down on the bench, and the person is trying to catch his breath. And you say, "Should I call 911?" And the person says, "No, no, no. I'm okay. I'm recovering. Uh, thanks so much. What a generous person you are." He says, "Well, what, what's the matter?" He says, "No, nothing's the matter. I just saw this movie. I just came out of this movie, and I—I I mean, it was just the most upsetting, the most frightening uh, experience like- I've had in my life." Well, you certainly wouldn't want to see that one. The hell you would, you would immediately want to see that movie. Right. So it's not you always about the, the movies. To, to It's a safe place to experience these lethal aspects of our um, nature so that when we experience them in real life, and inevitably we will, nobody gets out of here alive. And before we die, we will have to face the loss of other loved ones. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, if you've been through that experience uh, emotionally in a movie theater, and you survived it, it helps you survive it in real life. That's why film is not just just um, uh, an add-on, uh, you know. Uh, uh, it's really an essential part of our emotional and spiritual diet. If mm-hmm. we don't get art, in particular mm-hmm. narrative art, uh, we will become, in our, our spirits and our souls will become distended and misshapen in the same way that bodies do when uh, they are undernourished, uh, you know, in, in terms of protein uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, and uh, vitamins and minerals. And sure, all, sure, all, sure, sure. What I'm saying is that what we are doing is important. If you're a screenwriter, you are doing something that is very, very important. 
One last thought, and it's about Cubby Broccoli. He used to uh, <laughs> produce the the um, uh, James Bond pictures. Yeah. Um, and every time the new Bond picture came out, I always thought, I, you know, I sort of gave up on the Bond pictures some years ago, but I really did like the Sean Connery ones, um, which uh, they called them Cubby Broccoli, Albert Broccoli uh, uh, produced. Every time a new picture would come out, a new Bond picture would come out, he would give a press conference, and he would always say, I, we know what we're doing here. We're just trying to entertain the people. We're not doing Macbeth. We just want to enter provide some entertainment. And I always wanted to ask him, or I always was waiting for a reporter to ask him, have you ever seen Macbeth? <laughs> Do you have any idea how entertaining it is? <laughs> I mean, it's got witches and riddles and, and special effects. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the, the blood on the hands. Is this a dagger I see before me? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, he hallucinates. Um, it is a very entertaining uh, enterprise. It's not one or the other. Right. It, 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 these things all exist uh, together. They have no meaning separately. Uh, I, I, a friend of mine who's a member of a writing team, very successful TV team, I was in touch with him the other day, and he said he was talking to some somebody who wants to become a writer, and he, he said that he's part of a team. He works with a partner. And he said, oh, that's interesting. And how does it work? You do the characters and he does the story? I mean, can you... Can no, you that, no, that, no. Do no. it that, that way? I mean, it, it, uh, it can't be done that way. It can only be done as a unit, integrated. It's always sloppy and unorganized. Right, it's right. never perfect. Uh, the truest thing said in, I've ever heard said in my life was uh, by the Rolling Stones, and here it is. Can't get no. Exactly. And stop trying to be satisfied. I met I, Julius Epstein. He wrote, uh, he's now deceased, but he lived into his 90s. He wrote, among other pictures, Casablanca. And I said to him, oh, Mr. Epstein. Wow. Uh, all I want, what a thrill to meet you all I or any of my film phony pals. All we hope for is once in our lives, we should, as you did with Casablanca, touch something that's timeless and eternal mm -hmm. that will affect the hearts and minds of people. Now, wouldn't it be great if I could tell you that Julius said, oh, kind of you to say that. <laughs> Thank you. But he's a writer. That's not what he said. What he said, by the way, he lived here for, uh, he, he came out from New York in, when he was 20. He lived here for 70 something years, but he never lost that Brooklyn option. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he said, cast a blanket, smash a blanket. They fucked that up. Uh, you know the scene where Claude Rains at your dinner, and, and, and here he is barking and griping and vexing about how they ruined his movie. What movie? Casablanca. And all I could think to myself is, well, I wish somebody would, would ruin my movie. You know? Like that, like that, like that, right? Yeah, you know. but so, Richard, so once again, you've got to uh, um, stop being perfect. Just just be a human. Be, mm -hmm. You know what makes it? God is perfect. We are imperfect. Um, what makes us perfect, if if anything at all, is our imperfection. We are perfectly Im imperfect. And our mm. works don't need to be um, uh, perfect, perfect either. I'm promising you will succeed if you can make a movie that makes people feel some strong passion about anything, scare them, provoke them. You do not need to make them comfortable. Indeed, the last thing you want is for them to be comfortable. Make them uh, sorrowful. Frighten them outrage them offend them um make them laugh and anything yeah they they will uh, uh that that's what they're they're in, entitled to right uh that is the uh the job of the writer and the way to do that is by telling a good story telling a good story and by that... the way see there are guys out there who make movies that have terrific little moments Forgive me, I think the Cone brothers are like this, somewhat overappreciated. They can have like a wacky, crazy thing that happens, and it is kind of fun. And now, another way, you know, and, and vision and this and that, but much harder than that is having a spine, a through line where everything relates to every everything else. Parting shot, I, w I was breaking okay. <laughs> Steel again and, 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 and uh, Breaking Bad. Does anybody remember? Do you remember? You've seen seen uh, uh, Breaking Bad. Sure. Remember Walter White's opening line, the first line of dialogue spoken by Walter White. Mm -hmm. And matter of fact, 
first line of dialogue spoken by anybody in the series. Mm-mm. Okay, remember he it opens with a, kind oh, with of a the gun. Flash. Yeah, the gun. Well, he he's, he's racing through the desert in the right. RV. Right, right, right. That is, you know, you see a guy, you don't know what's going on. He's he's naked except for his underpants. He's wearing a gas mask. Right. Uh, Jesse Amazing. Pinkman is sitting next to him the same way. Right. They're driving like on the back. We don't know what the heck is going on in the in the back of the the vehicle. You can see two guys unconscious on the floor. You know what is this? We're wondering about this. That's good. We're curious. We want to know. When finally we catch up with him later in the the um, episode, the, that pilot episode, we see him in his classroom, his chemistry classroom, and he speaks his first line. And what is his first line? He says, "Chemistry is transformation." Oh. You could think about how chemistry changes things, but what can you think of something else that's transformation? Breaking Bad is transformation. Yeah. It's the transformation of this guy Walter White, a humble chemistry teacher in Albuquerque, New Mexico, into Heisinger or Heininger, whatever they call him. Heisinger. Interna- Heisinger. There it is, yes. a, a, an international drug lord. You see how everything has to fit together. What? That's the trick. Walter, we again, we could talk for another four hours. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. My, uh, it, it is, it is, it is just sitting there like it's like being in a master level uh, class. So thank you thank so you. much for for being on the show, my friend. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. You know where to reach me when you need me, and good luck to all the writers. Oh!